Parents are liars. You ask them who their favorite child is and they will tell you they have no favorite child. Wrong. They have a favorite child and they will give you signs, such as I have signs. That is a cop-out to say that you do not have a favorite child. In this allegory or analogy of horror movies, I myself have a lot of children. I got like the one that talks a lot. I got the one that fucking sucks and you hate and you wish you never had and you go to the movie to watch the sequel, the, the fourth sequel, which is not really the fourth sequel, it's the third technically, it's called Reborn, and then you get mad and then you hate the movie and then you start to question the entire franchise of your favorite franchise. And then you get so mad that you want your money back but you find out that you actually didn't spend a fucking dime on that movie but yet you still feel robbed. But this is not either of those children. This is my favorite child amongst my three favorite children. Now, I have three of them that I love and I will fight to the death for. But I have a favorite. If they ask me who it is, I'm going to tell them I don't, just like any good parent. But it's this one. This is The Thing. Uh, made in 1982 by John Carpenter, the mind behind Escape from New York, Halloween. I'm sure you've heard of Halloween. There's no way. Not, not the actual holiday, but the movie Halloween with Michael Myers. Uh, they live... Uh, the Fog, uh, the list goes on. He also produces a lot of other horror movies. So fans of horror will probably be like, oh yeah, The Thing, that's a cult classic, probably one of the best. And the other 80% of you probably clicked on this video because you were scrolling too slow and hit it. Either way, welcome to the video. Today I'm about to drop some shit on you that I have proof behind, and this is a big one. I'm sure you've read the title, and you've seen the thumbnail, and you already know. But, I'm here to tell you that McCready from The Thing is the thing. This is going to have a whole bunch of spoilers, so if you have not seen the thing, just turn this off and go watch it right now. You can watch it anywhere, and by anywhere, I mean you're going to have to go and buy it, because I can't fucking find this shit on any streaming service right now. But, go get it. It's on DVD. If you, you've ever heard of that, it's a little disc. You put it in a little slot, but you can get it on Voodoo. Anyway, watch the thing if you haven't watched the thing yet. Now, with that out of the way, let's get to the feet and toes, I mean the meat and potatoes of this video. Now, McCready is the thing, I have proof. The problem with this theory is a lot of people have their own conspiracies that argue against the idea that McCready is the thing. For those of you who just want to be spoiled right off the bat and don't care to watch the movie, this is a movie that follows a team of researchers that are in the Antarctica, or as flat earthers call it, the ice wall. And what they are doing there is doing research. A dog stumbles upon them, this dog just so happens to be the thing, an alien creature that fell to earth and was frozen in the ice and was dug up by some Norwegians. Uh, the dog is an alien, and that alien's whole thing, his whole purpose, is to spread the thing virus. I say virus, but it's really more of like a molecular alien that can replicate things and assimilate them perfectly. So what happens is this dog goes into the camp, it infects everyone, I'm just doing this for layman's term, everyone ends up fucking dying in the end, except two people, and that is both Spawn and Snake. Yeah, that's uh, McCready and Childs is their name in the actual movie. Uh, one played by uh, Kurt Russell and the other one played by Keith David. Both very famous people. The problem is everyone thinks that Keith David is the thing. Childs, the one that is not Kurt Russell. And that seems to be a very common consensus that Childs is the thing at the end. And they don't give you a direct answer. Uh, people have asked John Carpenter and he has said several times that he doesn't know or that he is not going to tell you, but I, I know. I know, and I have proof, and the key is behind me, and it has been behind me this whole time, just like it has been in the background of the movie the entire fucking time. This right here, this is a J and B. This is scotch. I'm sure you've heard of scotch before. It's a type of whiskey. And just like that, I'm infected. That'll make sense at the end of this video. <clears throat> that was not a good idea. I'm not retaking that. <laughs> 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 I 
Now, before we dive into the movie and into the scenes that I'm going to explain in chronological order, let's get two things out the way. One being debunking y'all's bullshit answers or y'all's bullshit debunks as to why McCready is not the thing. A lot of the times during these arguments that I've seen online or even in person, people like to argue that because you can't see child's breath at the end of the movie, child's is the thing. Because McCready just goes like... <sighs> and it just fucking vape everywhere from, you know, it being cold. And when Childs does it, ain't no shit. You can't see anything. So people claim that, oh, well, that means Childs isn't really breathing because he's a thing, and the thing is an alien that, you know, exists on a molecular level, doesn't have to breathe. Wrong. And I have proof. In the scene where Bennings becomes a thing, and this is indisputable, being that he is a fucking monster in the middle of the snow screaming, or rather hollering at a monster rate, you can see his breath when he screams. If we were gonna go on this assumption that the thing does not breathe, then why the fuck is Bennings breathing and you can see his breath? Wrong. <laughs> that is not the answer. Debunked. The book number two, The Glazed Eyes, or should I say The Glazed Eyes of Lies. Because Palmer's eyes don't have a gleam in him before he transforms into the thing, people think that non-gleaming eyes count as being infected, but if we look at both Bennings and Morris in the footage of the movie, you can see their eyes vary between gleaming and not gleaming. Therefore, proving this debunk debunked and wrong. Stupid. Get the fuck out of here. And the last one I feel I shouldn't bring up until the end because that'll add some tension and suspense to it. Because when I bring it up, it'll be cooler that way and funner that way. And I also believe it'll give you chills. So let's not talk about that one until the end. Now, the second thing that we have to discuss before we get into this and dive into this is we have to have a list of assumptions. These are things that we have to assume is true. Things that we have to understand is something that isn't accidental. These are things that happen in the movie and are and, and they happen like inorganically. These are meant to happen. Uh, I have also you may see me pull my phone up a few times but that's because I actually have like a full like essay script on this so that way I don't miss any key points. And I also gotta use this. This cost me too fucking much to not use this goddamn fucking phone. Alright. <laughs> Five assumptions, actually. Five in total. Uh, one being that we have to assume that the thing can assimilate in multiple ways. Uh, like a dog. If you watch the movie, there's a scene where they show the cell eating a dog cell becoming a dog molecularly. We have to assume that that can happen all the time. Obviously, they show it to us. So that means that if a cell of the thing were to get in my mouth, it would start replicating itself into my body and I'd become the thing slowly and microscopically. I get it. Cinematically, that's boring as fuck. Like, oh, I'm the thing. That, that didn't look cool at all, did it? No. So I get it. You know, to make a movie, it makes more sense for them to eat someone and then become that person. But it has been proven molecularly it happens. That's first assumption. Second assumption, each thing, each individual thing, is only concerned with itself and its personal survival, which we see in the scene with Morris whenever his head splits from his body to escape death. Every individual thing is in itself its own survival, survivalistic being. Uh, that's the whole point of the blood, the blood test, is because the blood tries to avoid pain. Um, so that's an assumption, can't argue with me on that either. Fuck you if you do. Number three, major events happen off screen. This does happen. Otherwise, how the fuck else are these people becoming the thing? Because they're getting infected off screen. Now, because random side characters, B characters, cannon fodder are becoming the thing off screen, for some reason, people think that, oh, the main character can't turn off screen because the character is off screen quite often. Keep that in mind because McCready is the thing. Assumption number four, John Carpenter knows what he's doing. Foreshadowing is an element that is in all of his movies. He understands the, the concept of foreshadow and understands that there has to be parallelism between the beginning and the end. So when I bring up points of foreshadowing, don't look at me like I'm fucking stupid. 
Don't look at me like I'm looking at this and overthinking it. No, John Carpenter is a fucking cinematic genius. All of this has its reasons and all of it has its points, and you will see that by the end of this video. Uh, number five, because it infects people on a molecular level, it's safe to assume that it works like the flu or any other virus or disease. You know, you catch it by it coming in contact with any open orifice. Any open orifice. <laughs> Regardless, the assumption is it transmits through molecular contact. So if I spit in your mouth and I'm the thing, you're about to become the thing, baby. And I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> right. With these assumptions in mind, we can continue. You can't argue with me on these. If we do have an argument on these, then my point's probably invalid, but it's not. McCready is the thing, and I know that 100%. Alright, let's get straight into the movie, starting from the very beginning. Now, as I said earlier, John Carpenter knows what he's doing. Foreshadowing is a thing. If you don't know what foreshadowing is, it is a symbolic scene or a symbolic reference, imagery, or a moment in a movie that will kind of give you a hint as to what is going to happen towards the end of the movie. There is imagery involved that pertains to parallelism between the beginning and the end. John Carpenter isn't the only one that does this. There are other, like Stanley Kubrick, uh, fucking Quentin Tarantino. They will have foreshadowing in their movies. They also have foreshadowing in books. It's not an uncommon theme. So in the first scene, we're introduced to uh, McCready, who is playing chess. Of all games, he's playing chess against a computer. Why is this very important and symbolic to the movie? It shows you that McCready is a chess player. McCready understands that there are sacrifices required and there are also things that need to be done in the beginning to help pertain to the ending and the outcome that he wants. McCready is a very tactical man and he ends up losing to the computer to which his response is to take his J&B alcohol and pour it into the computer and kill it from the inside by uh, fucking by short circuiting the was it motherbo motherboard mainframe? Yeah, short short circuit the motherboard. By short circuiting the motherboard. <laughs> I don't know shit about computers, man. I'm a horror fan, not a computer fan. Which I would also like to point out that a lot of this scene has the alcohol in frame constantly in frame, be it the bottle, the glass, it's not just product placement because a Chevrolet or Chevron, Chevron is also a product placement, but it's only there for like a scene. This is everywhere throughout the movie. The whole point of this is that McCready loses because the computer cheats and he decides to cheat and overreact as well by killing the machine by pouring the alcohol into the mouth of the computer. I say this for a reason. That is how we're introduced to McCready. A man who was also mentioned later down in the movie to be a very even-tempered man, but instead of being even-tempered in this scene, he overreacts and fucking destroys the mainframe of this computer. Like, probably the only computer he has. <laughs> now, some can argue for this foreshadow that McCready is a reference of humanity and the computer is a reference to the thing. And because the thing ends up cheating, because, let's face it, it's an alien, that McCready pours the alcohol into the machine to kill the machine. And a lot of this people like to parallel to the ending where McCready gives the bottle to Childs. I'm not going to give you my opinion here until we get to that point down the video. Let's move on to the next scene. I fully believe McCready is the thing, and I also have the full belief that McCready was actually the first to be infected. That's the big twist here. He is the first one to be infected. Now, let's see, where would this whole idea come in where McCready becomes infected? There has to be a point in the movie or a scene that kind of proves that, right? It's not conjecture. I can't just say, yeah, McCready's a thing. I'm different than all y'all. I got, I know, I know what I'm doing. Earth is flat. No, that is not what I'm doing here. I have concrete evidence of this. In the next scene, the scene where the Norwegian researchers are chasing the dog and trying to kill this dog, who we know as the audience already is the thing, the dog runs up on Bennings and jumps on Bennings. Now, here's the big kicker, and this is what sets this whole plan into motion. The dog licks Benning's glove. Now remember the five assumptions here? That this thing can spread like the flu? His glove is now contaminated with the saliva of the thing. 
and you will never believe what the next thing is that Bennings touches. Bennings gets shot. The dog takes off. The Norwegian researcher keeps running in with the gun. Then, McCready comes up to Bennings to see if he's okay and hands him the J and B, to which Bennings grabs with the same glove that was licked right here, which puts, as you would guess, the saliva onto the drain. Now, you can argue that this is also a point where Bennings becomes infected, but the problem with that idea is that Bennings, we see him getting infected and turned later in the movie. He's the first one we see get infected. So, obviously, his glove didn't touch the wound enough or it didn't really make contact with the saliva. The point is, the saliva that is on the, just the tip of the J&B alcohol bottle is going to end up touching the mouth of McCready. If you want to sit here and argue with me that McCready doesn't take another drink for the next 30 minutes of the movie, I gotta argue with you. This man's been drinking since the beginning, and you want to tell me he hasn't. So, that is where McCready gets infected. That is how McCready is able to become exposed to the thing. And let's move on to the next scene. Now we get to a mystery that has like taken over the forms for a bit, uh, asking about the key. This seems very prominent because it pertains to a scene later down the road that is a mystery that's brought up all the time in forms. Who got to the blood? The blood that is dripping out of the fridge. Dr. Copper and Gary both end up being proved not the thing. And they are the only people who had access to the fridge. Uh, I'm probably going to skip this part down the road because I'm explaining it now. I might bring it up just so I can have some relevancy to it. But they're the only ones with access to the vault, to the blood, and the blood has gotten into. A lot of people ask, well, how is this possible? How did the thing get a hold of the keys? Is it something that is happens off screen? Is it something we see that happens on screen even though we don't have any proof to that? I'm here to say there is proof and it wasn't off screen, or at least half of it wasn't off screen. This scene right here, whenever Windows catches Bennings getting assimilated in that storage room, Windows has the key in his hand. Let's go Bennings, I gotta get some sleep. And it, John Carpenter does a really good job of making sure you see Windows flipping the key as he walks through the door. When he notices Bennings turning into the thing, He drops the key and he takes off. This my people, my friends if you want to call me your friend, is where the key was taken from. This has to be the key to the vault. Whoever was infected at this point obviously was walking around, found the key, went to go do his thing later down the road. It wasn't Bennings because Bennings gets caught in Torch, which leaves only two other options, which is Morris and Palmer. We don't know when Palmer gets infected, but we do know that Morris is infected at this point. Could be Morris, or, hear me out on this, maybe it's somebody who plays chess, who understands that some things need to be taken care of in the beginning of the game to help his success later down the game. I'm willing to bet that it was McCready that got this key. McCready is also the thing, as I said from the beginning. I'm just That's one of my theories. That one I can't prove, but I have enough... enough um, Circumstantial evidence. There we go. Enough circumstantial evidence to prove that case. Alright, on to the next scene. I do want to mention that a lot of this theory of mine didn't come to fruition until I watched this in the theater, and I had to wrap my head around the idea that McCready is the thing. For you to see these little details, you have to watch this movie from the beginning, automatically assuming McCready is the thing. And this scene is one of those examples that I am about to unload on you. Are you ready for this? Now, we know that Blair goes crazy. Blair is the one that finds out that the thing is assimilating people with his super high-tech computer. This is the moment when he goes crazy and does the most sane thing by killing all modes of transportation, be it from the tractor, the chopper, even the dogs. He smashed up some of the chopper pretty good. He 
got most of the chopper and the tractor. And he's killed the rest of the dogs. He kills everything to keep them from leaving and then begins to destroy their communication systems with a axe. The whole point of this spiel is when they catch him and they throw him into the shed. Uh, this is a very big pivotal moment on why I think that McCready is the thing. You have Blair in the shed being closed up in there. McCready is the one to talk to him. Keep that in mind. McCready's the one doing this. McCready walks up to him and what do you see in the frame? A fucking Smirnoff bottle. McCready then proceeds to talk to Blair and grab the bottle. Unscrews the lid, takes the smallest fucking sip I'd ever seen McCready take. I don't know who to trust. Puts it back on, sets it right back down. Blair asks him, I don't know who to trust. McCready says, well, why don't you just trust, trust in the Lord. Lord. What he did there is put the thing on the on the Smirnoff bottle and set it there for Blair to drink later down the road. He's gonna drink that Smirnoff bottle. There's no way he's not going to. That, my friends, is how McCready infected people in the thing. That was his plan. It was to set the molecules of the thing onto other bottles, other food, anything that was going to touch the mouths of other people. Now, you may think that, oh, that's stupid, over this convoluted, well, let's go on to the next scene here. So we get to the scene where Fuchs is alone in his room, reading up on Blair's paperwork and trying to come up with an answer for the thing. McCready walks up on him and asks him, You come up with anything yet? Fuchs begins to tell him an idea of his. He says, But McCready, I've been thinking, if a small particle of this thing is enough to take over an entire organism, then everyone should prepare their own meals, and I suggest we only eat out of cans. McCready says, All right. Remember, you have to watch this with McCready being the thing in mind. McCready gives him this look, walks away, and I'm sure if you've seen this movie before, you know what happens next. Coincidentally, right after Fuchs comes up with an idea that interrupts McCready's plan, he just kills him. The power goes out, you see a shadow, Fuchs goes outside to see what the problem is, and then the next thing you know, they find his glasses out on the fucking snow with a burnt up body. And they ask McCready, what do you think happened? And of course, McCready, the one who probably did it, I say probably, but I know 100% that he did do it, says, oh, well, he probably burned himself, or he tried to burn himself before the thing got to him. Maybe he burned himself before it could get to him. These are stupid answers. I don't know why anyone would believe that. But I just think it's a coincidence that Fuchs comes up with an idea that counters McCready's plan from the beginning, and now he's dead before anyone was even told this plan. This is one of the other big pivotal points of my argument. If you don't think that it makes sense, you're stupid. While they go out and find Fuchs's remaining dust corpse of ash, McCready makes this comment of, you know, we can't go back and. Knowles asks, why can't we go? And McCready's all like, Where are we going? Up to my shack. What the hell for? Because when I left yesterday, I turned the lights off. And he's all like, all right, come with me. We're going to go check it out. Y'all go back. Which is exactly what you would want to hear from a thing that's trying to assimilate everyone, right? All y'all leave, this guy's coming along with me to my own shack that just so happened to have the light on. Man's is lying, I don't know what to tell you here. And there's further proof of this by the fact that Knowles is the only one that comes back from that and tells him that he found McCready's undergarments all ripped up. Where's McCready? I cut him loose of the light up by his shack. We were up checking around his place. I found this. It was stashed in his own oil furnace. Wind must have dislodged it, but I don't think he saw me find it. Almost as if he got assimilated maybe earlier in the movie, like I stated. But regardless of it, they also mentioned Nothing human could have made it back here in this weather without a guide like And I think that's kind of a big uh, red flag that that's a good point. And McCready broke in 
And this is where we see him go crazy with the flamethrower and the dynamite and you know, you kill me, I kill all of y'all just like a thing would say if it was the thing. Regardless, this is a scene that coincides with my argument that McCready is the thing. It just seems to be very coincidental that McCready's light is on. It's his light, by the way, that is on. He brings one person, by the way, with him alone, by the way, to his shack. Together. And I think, the, you know, the proof is in the pudding. But let's continue on to the next scene. Probably the biggest, most famous scene from the movie. We're talking about the blood scene, the blood test scene. This right here is probably the biggest crux to my argument. What is it you say? How did McCready's blood pass the blood test if he is the thing? Yes, this is a debate that I've been having with myself internally for a while now. This is the biggest point of this argument of mine that leaves me thinking, maybe I'm the stupid one. Wrong. You're the stupid one. If we're going by my first five assumptions, of course. Being that assumption number three proves my point, things happen off screen. Remember, off screen is a thing that does happen in movies. Just because you don't see it take place on camera doesn't mean it didn't take place at all. Speaking of things that don't take place on camera, do you recall ever seeing McCready cut himself and put his blood into one of those little, what are they called? Petri dishes. Petri dishes? No the fuck you don't. In fact, you only see two people, and that's Windows and Nulls. Regardless, it happens off screen. Now, I'm willing to wager money that, you remember earlier when I was talking about the blood being stolen by someone, and possibly it being McCready, could be Morse. Or, hear me out on this, maybe it's somebody who plays chess. There is a motive to this. McCready had access to the blood if he was the one to find the key. Blood that he could possibly sleight of hand his way into a petri dish and make it seem like he cut himself. Being the thing, I really, we, 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 as in you and I both don't know what the thing is capable of. It could turn into any animal, any creature, any alien creature, things we haven't seen before. So who's to say that, like, they can't, I mean, okay, this is just conjecture at this point. But like, who's to say that McCready can't make a pocket in his finger and put false blood in it and keep the molecular structure from taking it over? Who's to say that can't happen? Who's to say that he just didn't fucking spit it into it? Either way, you don't see it happen. And that really is my only argument to this crux. You do not see him cut himself. You do not see him put the blood into the Petri dish. But you don't see it happen. McCready's the thing. If you have proof or any idea that McCready did cut himself and it was his actual blood that you see on screen, please comment. I'm, I'm really, I would love to see y'all's idea behind that, but doesn't happen on screen, doesn't happen at all, I don't think. So we move on to the next scene that I really want to discuss here. They all discover who is the thing and who is not, and they are now left with one person left to test, and that would be Blair. So they go to Blair's shack. Uh, he's not there anymore. He, if, if you recall from the scene earlier, McCready went to go check on Blair and he had a noose. And like he was about to kill himself, but then he decided not to, which I think that was around the point that he drunk the Smirnoff probably to off himself and do and commit not alive anymore and assimilated into the thing. So upon finding the noose in Blair's shack, they don't find Blair. Um, he's missing, which I think it's kind of safe to say that he is one of the things. You get to the point in the movie where McCready's trying to blow everything up. Uh, him, Knowles, and uh, Gary are out and about throwing dynamite and throwing Molotov cocktails into every single room of the research facility, blowing it up. So you get to the climax of the movie where Blair comes out and starts attacking everybody one by one outside of McCready's view and they start disappearing. Why not take McCready? I'm just throwing that out there. So as we move forward, McCready is the only one left, minus child who we don't know where he's at right now. He is off screen. The thing, the giant monster comes up out the ground, looks at McCready 
to which he screams or I guess hollers at McCready in monster language. And McCready looks at him with the explosives in hand and says, Now, I'm willing to wager that that wasn't a one-liner, but that he actually understood what the thing was telling him. The thing wasn't screaming or yelling at him, he was talking to him. Probably asking McCready, why are you doing this? We're on the same team, what the fuck are you doing? Fuck you for this shit. McCready says, well, fuck you too. Throws the explosives into the thing and he explodes. McCready somehow survives this explosion miraculously, to which he ends up crawling out Side, drinking, Jane B. Which brings me to another debunk that I was going to mention earlier, but I saved for now. One of the biggest proofs that people say Childs is the thing is that McCready has a bottle of gasoline. Childs appears later at the inn, and he's all like, You the only one who made it? McCready's like, Where were you, Childs? Thought I saw Blair. But he was gone for a really long time. And McCready's all like, well, I guess we don't have any more energy to do anything. So Child's like, so what do you want to do? And McCready goes, I guess we'll wait. And he hands Child's the bottle. Why don't we just wait here for a little while? Childs grabs it and takes a drink. The argument is that McCready gave him a bottle of gasoline. To which if McCready gave Childs a bottle of gasoline and Childs drinks the gasoline, the thing is not going to know what alcohol is supposed to taste like or at all what anything tastes like, so he has to act like it's alcohol. And Childs drinks it and acts like nothing happened. McCready gave him gasoline, watches as Childs drinks the gasoline, sees that he's playing this bit of, oh, this is good. And now, in people's eyes, McCready knows Childs is a thing now. From that moment. Well, here's my big debunk of that. If you zoom in, he is drinking the J&B bottle. Now maybe you could, you could argue that the gasoline was probably poured into the J&B bottle. But I also want to preface with everything that I've been talking about to this point. The Smirnoff bottle, the, the drink that caught him caught from the beginning, him killing Fuchs for trying to stop people from drinking from other people's drinks. McCready's been using this as his weapon just like he was using this as the weapon in the beginning of the movie to kill the machine. The machine is not the thing, the machine is the human. So whenever McCready hands Childs the bottle of alcohol, a bottle that is trapped, booby-trapped, with the molecule that assimilates people, or as I like to call, the semi-juice, and Childs touches his lips to the bottle, I want you to notice in this moment, McCready smiles and the music plays. What music, you ask? The music of the thing. Not was it that McCready realized Childs is the thing, but McCready is smiling because he won. He gave Childs the bottle that is trapped and booby-trapped, the semi-juice if you will, and he drunk it and is now infected. McCready won. Yes, he may freeze. Yes, him and Childs will freeze to death, but there will be a search party or an extraction team that will come to the facility where they haven't heard contact from them for a minute. They'll find the bodies, 
they're going to take him back home. Obviously, their family has to give him a funeral. And just like the beginning of the movie, or I guess more of the middle of the movie, the bodies will dethaw and the thing will be back at it again in the white bands. So remember, don't drink from strangers, man. <laughs> so with that, I think I have made a great case. If you disagree with me, I would love to see your comments and also debunk them later, maybe in a video in the future. So please put your comments as to why you think I am wrong. I really hope I opened your eyes to the fact that McCready is the thing and you can't change my mind. I am sorry, <laughs> wrong again. Uh, I'm Victor Morales from 2 Dim Media. My music is still under works and will constantly be coming out. I get it, this is a rap music channel, but I've given hints that this video was coming eventually. And here it is. If you do like this and this for some reason becomes a viral, I will absolutely do way more of these. I, I have a bunch of things for like The Shining or The Exorcist. I'm sure there are other movies. I could discuss Childs, see if Childs is a thing, but I really don't care because McCready's the main character and I think that's a fucking... That should be enough for you. Plus, if Childs was a thing, McCready would know and wouldn't have had to sabotage him at the end, which he did do. Uh, thanks for watching. Um, see you next time, if be it a year or two, because this took me way too long to put out. Uh, later.